we'll just give people a couple of minutes again don't forget that this will go onto the youtube channel so you don't actually have to watch it this second if anybody misses it or you know anybody that misses it and actually wants to uh watch it um have your notepad ready if you've got a copy of the poems have them ready but if you haven't in an ideal world we will know the quotations that we would reference anyway because of our revision um and our studies which have allowed us to to know the poems quite well um first things first then you know you're going to get marked on analysis you know you're going to get marked on um knowledge and you know you're going to get marked on context and one of the wonderful things about being a charge and exposure guys is that your poet so ted hughes yeah and wilfred owen um now ted hughes okay is a huge fan of wilfred owen and therefore he in being a charge is attempting to mimic wilfred owen's war poetry so if you were given being a charge i would always choose exposure and vice versa because if he's trying to mimic wilfred owen then obviously there will be a, si a similarity in terms of um subject matter and in terms of what they're trying to portray about war and one of the things that they are trying to portray about war is that of dehumanization so our soldiers are dehumanized okay and the dehumanization of the soldiers comes across in lots of quotations which we're going to we're going to have a look at as well and what we're also going to get is just just pure suffering aren't we um we're going to get physical suffering which is given to you in the first line of exposure um, and we're going to get mental suffering, which is again given in the first line of exposure and it's throughout BNF charge. One of the um, really pivotal and interesting things about BNF charge is that we can tell that the soldier does not want to be there. We can also tell that he's not so sure what he's fighting for, which is why we get that simile about dropped like uh, luxuries and he talks about dignity and things like that. Now, if you've been doing your revision, you will be looking here and saying, right, I'm going to pick these six quotations, and I'm going to pick these six quotations, and it's easy to cross-reference. I always say to my students, looking at the poem should be a luxury, yeah? Because we should just know, actually, do you know what? I've been doing my revision. I know exactly what I'm going to say about being a charge. We're golden, okay? Um, and just a quick tip, if you're going to write an essay, and I suggest that you do, um, I get my students to number those essay, essays one, two, three. One is that they've had to look at both poems in front of them as they've done it. Two is they've looked at one. And three is that they haven't actually had to consult the poems. Because what that does is it gives you a rating on your confidence. It also shows you where your weakness is. We should always be working weakness. In terms of, of, of um, personal choice, if we start looking at bayonet charge, all right, um, in terms of analysis and then we look at comparison, don't forget that we've got the word charge and charge instantly gives us two meanings. So that gives us one of our grade nine terms, which is alternatively charge. We know that our men are expected to rush forward. So we've got bravery in the face of the enemy, bravery in the face of death and just how frightening it is for the men to go over the top. But the other um, meaning of charge is debt. Price. So we are instantly given the question um, as a reader as to um, how much we are indebted to these men and it's a debt that we can never pay we can't ever pay the price um back that they have sacrificed their lives for us okay so again the the charge and the cost is too much to bear which we can take across to exposure in terms of the title of that which we'll look at in a minute if you wanted to do bayonet then remember the bayonet is on the end of the rifle and it's what we call the personal killing guys because if you are if you if you are killing someone with a bayonet you have to be right on top of them so it's called the personal killing because of how close you are it also shows you what they have to do in order to kill the enemy not only have they got to get across no man's arm but they've got to get right on top of the the bad guy if you like it's her, it's a horrific notion because how many of them actually got there and it's no wonder that in the middle of this poem he is petrified and he is bewildered and then if we move down in terms of being a charge we've got in media rays all right so we get suddenly right now in media rays means in the middle of so in the middle of which you can use in your unseen poetry okay so in media rays in the middle of now suddenly first word adverb Suddenly means, again, if you look at the dictionary, diction, dictionary is your best friend, you have had no transition. 
there's no transitionary period. Suddenly he awoke. He has been woken up in the middle of the night and told, get across there and kill somebody. Like you, you can't even imagine, A, what that feels like would be if you're not prepared. So when we are thrown into the middle of this particular scenario, we don't know what's come before, other than the man is absolutely petrified, doesn't know why he's there, isn't so keen on killing. And now we've got this. So it exasperates the, the idea, it magnifies the idea that this man is not a danger to anyone other than himself. Okay, and then again, like way in the middle of the night, very difficult. So suddenly here you walk running. Your verbs, if you are agreed, I would say, and again, no offence intended here, a four or a five or a six, we get, if you chart your verbs, okay, in BNF chart, we've got running, we've got crawling, uh, we've got lugging, and we, he lugs, he's dazzled. Um, in terms of like action, sorry, um, stumbling, sorry. If you chart the actions of the guy, especially those three, running, stumbling and crawling, we see the physical deterioration of the man. Yeah, running, stumbling, crawling. And we see that he is beginning um, to become a bigger target. If somebody's sprinting away from you and you're trying to shoot, it, it might be difficult to hit them. But if they are crawling in front of you, crawling implies... Um, desperation um it's what we do when we're a baby so again we're talking about um the destruction of innocence we're talking about needing uh, protection Lugged and dazzled we'll come to in a minute when we're looking at um the burden the metaphorical burden that he bears so so far being it charged suddenly and the verbs moving on we are told guys that his sweat is heavy right so lovely metaphor for us and i'm going to add that to lugged because he lugs his rifle now, the metaphor of sweat heavy, yes, we can talk about the obvious thing, which is pressure. Yeah, this sweat is heavy because he feels the pressure to A, survive. B, he feels like he has to kill. All right, and C, there is a reference to cowardice, which we're going to come to in a moment. So again, perhaps he feels like it's just too much. Yeah, what, we, what I'm being asked here is too much for me. And then the other thing we've got with sweat being heavy is not just pressure. We've got the burden of war. Yes, it is it is en ensuring that this is a massive struggle and the burden for this particular man is too much to bear because don't forget we're not talking about men who had volunteered here we're talking about the ones that actually had also been told that they had to go um sweat heavy you can link to molten iron this idea that it's coming out the center of his chest it's too much the pressure's too much you can see again that the the only um danger of this man is his mentality and obviously himself the lugging of the rifle we link in. So if you're thinking about your paragraphs and your structure in this essay, okay, because he doesn't want to carry the rifle. So when I talk about burden, the weapon becomes that and it's too heavy and he has to lug it around. Yeah, it's, it seems unfamiliar to him, like, like it's very strange that he's lugging it. And then worse than that, as he's running, he's dazzled. Now, if you're dazzled, he, he's struggling to see. It's shock, it's surprise. This guy, he almost sounds like a rabbit in the headlights, doesn't he? We wonder how he ever gets across to the hedges at the other side. Moving down, um, we are told about raw, okay? His skin is raw. So again, that links you back to the fact that he's carrying this heavy backpack, which is um, becomes the burden, and it's taking the skin off of him. Raw means, again, when we're talking about suddenly, if something is raw, it is not prepared. If it's raw, his skin is coming off. So he's already physically wounded or physically in pain or physically in agony before he's even shot at. Because because of what we're asking them to carry, I don't know if anybody's put the backpack on, it's about 35 kilos, that is heavy going. Um, so no wonder he's stumbling around and crawling around, it's just mass struggle. Interesting, guys, for structure as well, if you look at being a charge, we get pure action in stanza one, thought um, in stanza two, and action in stanza three. Stanza two, where he starts to think, slows the pace of the poem. Now, we can argue that that actually becomes its own problem, because if he stops to think and we get to the start in bewilderment and then you get your shazera, then he, we, we don't have time to stop and think in this particular particular moment. So, there's quite a few good instances of Shazera and being a charge, but I would choose that one because the Shazera after bewilderment highlights that he's confused. Why am I here? What have I got to do? Why have I got to kill them? I don't have a reason. What am I fighting for? Does cowardice matter? Does patriotism matter? How do we define a coward? And um, moving down, I'm going to move down to the cowardice reference just because in my personal opinion, I think it's the most powerful one in the poem. All right, so we've got the yellow hair. Now, the yellow hair 
that is trapped in a threshing machine at the end of this poem um, does a lot for you guys, it, it really does. Now, we'll start with the colour yellow. Um, the colour yellow um, is symbolic of cowardice in English, so there's our word, all right, in terms of cowardice. Now, dehumanisation, as I said here, is the fact that our soldier is compared to a hare, right? So imagine a little hare. Now, hare. They are famous for running away. If you ever go to a greyhound race or you've seen a greyhound race, they let loose the hair and it runs and the greyhounds chase it. So or now we've got running away and we've got prey. Right? A bigger predator is always going to come for uh, chase and eat or kill the hair. It is vulnerable. Lots of them are white and it is innocent. It's not a deadly animal, nobody's particularly frightened of it, can't really defend itself. So now, when we make him the hare in this massive image of dehumanisation, we've got this huge image of him running scared, yeah? He feels like he's being a coward because he doesn't want to be there, he doesn't know why he's there, he doesn't want to kill anyone. Um, and he's prey to a bigger predator. Obviously, in this instance, the predator is the Germans at the other side, isn't it really? Or the enemy at the other side. And actually, the yellow hare is dead. So you could argue we've got that foreshadowing there, all right? Now, again, ask the examiner questions. How do we define a coward? Because he's there, he's there, he's in battle, he's running across that field. Now we can come to the threshing machine. So the threshing machine has killed the hare, yeah? We've got, again, big metaphors here. The threshing machine is like, it's a circular movement, it takes up the ground and it's got like metal spikes. The yellow hair is caught in the middle and it's dead now the threshing machine metaphorically becomes humanity doesn't it this is what we do to each other and this threshing notion of a continuing almost indicates um the world war one and world war two and just war in general and fighting and conflict in general and i suppose now when we're talking about dehumanization look what we do to each other so if we're talking about the effect of conflict well one of the effects of conflict um is that we have transformed ourselves into killers, haven't we? We have transformed ourselves into emotionless things like this machine, yeah, that is killing something. I'm just gonna move across to expo exposure. That's by no means everything. As I say, this is not a video where I'm doing the entire poem. Um, exposure has gotta be one of my favorites. Um, I would say, personal preference, probably the best war poem that you've got in terms of looking for a grade nine in your analysis. Exposure, we know Wilfred Owen is there, right? He is in that trench telling you. So this is your first hand account. This is exactly what it was like, which is harrowing. Wilfred Owen is trying to um, educate people about the brutality of war. He's trying to undercut propaganda and that idea that it was, um, you were gonna be a heroic and you were gonna join this game and play and um, everyone was gonna um, bow at your feet. And he does that from your first word. So if you are analysing exposure, I always stress to my kids, start with the title. Because if you go definition, dictionary definition, as always, that means that you don't have a, no defence against something, okay? So you don't have a defence against something, which means you are already weak, vulnerable, struggling in some way. Then we start looking at what our men can't defend themselves against in this poem. The obvious one for your grade four and five and maybe six is the weather, yeah, and the enemy, the lies of propaganda, but also, I suppose, it's the mental suffering that the soldiers were going to come home with. They weren't aware, it wasn't really diagnosed then, so they weren't aware of the mental suffering that they were also going to face, which is reiterated in the first three words, our brains ache, shazura. Exposure as well, if we start looking at where did it come from, it comes from the uh, Middle English um, and it comes from the word enclosure. So we got the word exposure from enclosure. Now, an enclosure is reminds us of animals in a pen. There's your dehumanisation. There's our men trapped in the trench, being mistreated. They're not being fed. They're susceptible to disease. We're going to ask them to fight. Yeah, we've got this horrific image of entrapment, entrapment of animals, mass numbers. Moving down, again, our brain's ache would be where I went next. Shazira, right? Because there's loads in there. Again, we have got prolonged suffering here. Right, ache, 
something if it's a prolonged suffering it foreshadows the entire poem the content of the poem and what he's going to tell us about soldiers in the trench and then we get our shazira so it again it uh, magnifies highlights whichever word you want to use the fact that um, they are physically suffering, the weather, etc., etc., and our external factors like that, and they are internally suffering because of what is going on around them. Okay, our obviously it's the collective and brains. We know what's going on there. If we move down, we are told that the the wind is mad, mad gusts tugging on the wire. Now, again, we're going to start looking at the fact that the wind is mad because we're not just talking about extreme emotion there and anger, but we're talking about insanity. And again, ask yourself, that's a parallel. So if you chart the weather and you chart the suffering of the man, they coincide with one another. They are, par they are mirror images. So we get our brain take the mad gust tugging on the wire, then it becomes the snow, then it becomes the ice. So where that worsens... Um, the suffering of the men does as well because it goes to the brains again and then it goes the fact that the ice is stuck on them then they're dead and the burying party comes for them at the end um we've also got the fact that the men are twitching agonies again it sounds like it's involuntary it's out of their, con their control which leads you back to this if they can't defend themselves how will they survive yep um one of the great ones as well in exposure, I, I think, is the love of God is dying. So I'm going to talk about God is dying then. Imagine, you've all seen it in films and things like that, where people are in desperate positions so they pray to God. Now what you get here, guys, is they've given up on their dreams, they see that their ghosts are slowly dragging home, and then they give up on God. So actually now we've got this bigger idea that they can't even be protected by their religious beliefs and they've got no belief in anything anymore. So when we're talking about desperation, actually we just have men who have mentally and physically been battered and don't believe that they're going to go home, but don't also don't believe that they can be saved and they abandon even religion. Okay, so you can see, like I said, where the weather worsens, the desperation and the suffering of the men does as well. All their eyes are ice is a quick one for you as well if you are a four to six. And then if you want to use that and you're a seven to nine, then start looking at all. All right. Because we know what we're going to see about ice. We know what we're going to see about their eyes being ice that they're dead and they're emotionless and things like that. So that, that tends to be a more obvious analysis. But start looking at words like all because it takes you back to our that idea that it's not just Wilfred Owen telling you that, oh, I'm in pain. He's telling you that they all are. And then it tells us what we have asked these people to do. Um I would say, and this is again personal preference if your English teacher tells you to ignore, absolutely ignore, to ignore but nothing happens. Uh, my experience of, of marking answers with an analysis of but nothing happens is that students just say they are bored. Yeah, and, and that's not really telling us about, um, about Wilfred Owen's suffering really. Um, if you're just saying that he's in the trench and he's bored waiting for something to occur. So I would leave but nothing happens. Um, unless you've got a really, really original analysis of that. Um, I think when you chart the poem, uh, you know, obviously we've got nothing happens, nothing happens. Um, I think the better one is we turn back to our dying. And I think when he, when Wilfred Owen says we turn back to our dying, then actually we've got the moment where some of them give up and accept the inevitability of we're going to die here and we're going to be buried here and home is no longer comfort anymore, okay? Now, in terms of comparing, I'll just wipe that. Um, one of my pet peeves, and I'm sure it's a lot of English teachers' pet peeves as well, is that students will hand in an essay, okay? They hand in their poetry essay and you're reading it and you're like, wow, that's fantastic. That analysis is fantastic. And what they've done is they've written about the poems in isolation of one another. So you, you write about being a charge and you write about exposure, and you write being a charge, and you write about exposure, and you don't compare them at all. Now, I don't think we need to go over the top here, right? So let me just explain how I teach it. Again, ignore where, where you think it's rubbish or where you just don't need it. So paragraph one, okay? You answer the question. Because remember, this is an exam, guys, where time is not on your side it just isn't okay so if you think you are going to write and finish your essay you're just not going to do it because they don't give you time to do it they give you time to test what you will analyze i.e 
Are you judicious enough? Are you original enough? Do you know the poem well enough? So paragraph one answers the question, right? So if it's the effect of conflict, explain what the effect of conflict is in being a charge versus exposure, right? Answer the question. Now, I'm just going to do language here, right? So don't be sitting there thinking oh, she hasn't even touched structure. Obviously, you can include structure um, where you see fit, but I'm just going to show you how to do an, a language analysis here. Now, your next paragraph. This is where you play smart. So you will know in your head, actually, I know being a charge by the next closure. I would say start with a poem you know the best. So instantly the examiner is getting the best version of you. Because if you leave it too late to show the best version of you, they're probably bored, right? True. So depending on which one you know better, that would be where your analysis should start, right? So for argument's sake, let's just all agree we know exposure better, right? So your first paragraph in terms of analysis is going to analyse exposure and our brain's ache. In depth, right? You're going to analyse that word in depth. You're going to analyse that word in depth. Right? Okay, nothing difficult so far. Then we're going to move to paragraph three. And this is where we're going to bring in b and charge. However, you need a comparative connective. I know you're sitting there thinking, she's t t uh, treating us like we're stupid. I can't even tell you how many people don't do it. So if you think it's similar, the suffering or the effect of conflict, then you put similarly in BNS charge. Much like, in much the same way, yes? If it's not, obviously we go to a comparative connective that contrasts. However, the opening of BNS charge does this, right? And again, we use what we know. So we're going to start with charge. We're going to start with maybe suddenly, okay? And again, why am I only doing two per paragraph? Because your analysis should be detailed enough and we want to go seamlessly from poem to poem. We come back to exposure, guess what? We start with a connective. Why do I say start with it? So it's right there. Ah, okay, you might be thinking, I'm going to embed it. Absolutely embed it within a paragraph if you want, but you need it. And we do the same thing again. And we go back to our revision of exposure, right? What do I want here? Do I want the mad gust tugging on the wire? Do I want the fact that the snow is black? Do I want all their eyes are eyes? And again, you're going to do another two quotations there. And we do this and we do this methodically. We come back to being a charge with a connector and we do our, and you do it like that. And yes, it's mechanical, but you are getting what you need, which is the comparison with the quotations and the in-depth analysis. Now, if you do not have an in-depth analysis, then perhaps you will put three quotations in the paragraph because we don't want flimsy little paragraphs that just dot around, okay? Um, you will find on the YouTube channel, guys, there is a playlist with 55 videos on comparing all of the poems. Watch them. There is one on, uh, there's quite a few on exposure, how to analyse exposure to the grade nine. There's also how to analyse it to the grade six. Use this time wisely as I finish all my videos like this. Write an essay and give it to your teacher or give it to me and see what, see what the crack is in terms of your comparison. There is no excuse not to know the poems. Now, those students stress and saying, I will, there's 15, 15 poems. Condense it down to the five to seven most important quotations that you know you're always going to be able to use. Okay, keep doing your essays. I put some stuff on Instagram yesterday. If you're in year nine and ten, do them. There is no excuse when you've got all day not to do something. Um, check back Thursday. We're going to do English language. I'm going to do question two, which is language analysis. And stay safe, stay well, eat healthy, go for walks, keep up with your revision. We're proud of you and we miss you. And goodbye.